So talk me through how this unfolded in Italy and the kind of national psyche. And, you know, just talk us through that, because it's a story that we don't get to hear firsthand and you've been living it firsthand. So when you first saw it in China, what did you think? Uh, well, uh, like, I think it's pretty natural for the human being. When we first heard from China, we were quite relaxed. Uh, you don't think this is going to come to you, right? Um, and it did come. Uh, where, where are we now in Italy? Just to update the numbers, roughly 15,000 official recognized cases, uh, about 1,000 deaths, about 1,300 healed. And the exponential growth continues, both in terms of new cases, of critical cases, of deaths, and of healings, luckily. Um, we haven't really had a chance to learn from uh, the Chinese experience. You, you, you might have seen uh, the picture, that's, the chart has been going around that shows how the curves of the Hubei province in China and of Italy overlap precisely with, a, like a, I think it's a 38 days delay. And by the way, Hubei and Italy have about the same population, 55 million Hubei, 60 million Italy. Uh, now, there's another chart going around these days that shows the same overlap, the beginning of the same overlap between Italy and the rest of Europe, which is kind of 10 days behind. So I was saying we didn't have a chance to really learn from the Chinese experience. It was certainly a mistake on us as people and on the government, but it wasn't easy because uh, despite the strong uh, trade and business relationship between Chinese, China and Italy, there's a distance, both geographically and culturally. So, and we were the first ones in the Western world, so it wasn't that easy. Now, I'm only today hearing uh, France, Germany, the rest of Europe taking serious action. The last few days from here, the sentiment was, what are these guys waiting? It's they're just repeating our mistakes, but this mistake is not acceptable, in my opinion. So I'm glad that, that they are moving, and I urge, if I could speak to them, uh, I would urge them to move again. There's a great chart by a guy called Thomas Puey on Medium that shows uh, how much impact one day of delay in implementing what they call social distancing policies or measures can make in, in the number of cases, and it's amazing. So that alone should convince everybody to, to take a more prudent approach. So what is, the uh, situation, what is the situation now in Italy in terms of what's shut down, what businesses are open? I mean, what's going on economically and socially now? So um, the only open businesses are uh, for commercial activity on the streets, are pharmacies and food. All the rest is closed, but offices and companies can be open and operate as far as they respect policies and implement policies that allow people to stay distant one from the other. And uh, it's pretty personal. Every manager uh, had uh, to choose their own way to implement this. So it's not a total business shutdown. Um, and what about before the, going? What before about going that, into, oh. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. What about factories? I mean, the industrial heartland of of Europe yeah. is North Italy, right? How, how how does that affect the industrial output of the country? It will be affected, but factories are not shut down. They're continuing to run. Wow. Of course, they've slowed down because if you need to have, for example, the simpler thing is half of the workforce home and half at the office uh, or at the factory and uh, in and out alternating 50-50. So that clearly reduces your workforce. But on the other hand, consumption is clearly reduced much, much more than that. So it should stay quite in balance. I mean, the economical impact is certainly there. But let, let, let me be, before going into the economical impact, uh, let, uh, a few words on, on one thing. This 
it doesn't matter how, how late you come to it, but this thing really gets into people's minds. So it's, it's a priority to, to, to be calm, to take care of yourselves, to eat well, uh, and to be strong. It's the first time in a way that our generation is faced with such a, a chance to prove uh, our resilience. Uh, this is, I, I don't want to compare it with the war. We ha we're under a roof, we're, we're healthy, we're warm, we've got food, we've got internet. We've even got applications that allow us to do video call uh, socially. Uh, a couple of days ago, we celebrated my daddy's birthday, 85, in, uh, with a video call app. So <laughs> come on, this is not a war. We're not being bombed the buildings and the houses. But, the, but in our generation, which is probably weaker than that of our grandparents and great-grandparents, it's the first time of such a proof. So it's important to understand this and be very, uh, stay very strong. Um, the other thing, uh, uh, it's clear that the healthcare system is heavily stressed. There is a picture that became very famous in Italy of Francesca, this nurse, falling asleep on her desk after, a, I don't know, 10, 12 hours uninterrupted work. And around um, Francesca and the nurses and the doctors, there's an amazing number of people doing an excellent job and the resources are pretty stretched. Um, this morning, the first call I had was with my friend Diego who runs the logistics for a big hospital in Bologna. He takes 45 minutes to work, typically, but because they've stopped, suspended most of the high-speed trains to avoid uh, people going around uh, and, and gathering together, and because of the extended uh, uh, hours they need to work, he, it takes him now, well, he's left with very few hours of sleep and of rest. So, and his first task this morning was to find a forklift to move uh, one of those huge emergency tents to accommodate more beds. Um, my second call this morning was with another friend, uh, Paolo, that runs a hospitality business. He was calling all the landlords. He manages the short-term rent of the apartment for to convince them to give out for free the apartments to the doctors and the people working in the hospitals that, like Diego, cannot commute every day because it's too far, otherwise they sleep one hour instead of three. Um, one, one, one evidence I had, uh, the doctors were the first ones uh, two, three, four weeks ago to take this thing seriously while everybody else was pretty relaxed. It's exposed, it's quite clear that they know how to do the job. And uh, a positive signal, if you want, these days, yesterday for the first time I heard the doctor publicly, the general manager of a big hospital here in Lombardia, saying um, we have the resources. They've come, we've been, we've been provided with what we need, so you guys just do your job, stay home, and we'll fix this. Your, your, your question was on the economy. Oh, no, no, sorry, let's go back a little bit to this. So the healthcare system overloading, and we're hearing stories in Italy that in some places it's very, basically a choice of who lives and who dies when you're under a, a stretched resources situation. What kind of stories are you hearing on, on, on this stretch of resources that's going on? Because this is a lot of things that people don't understand. They say the death rate's not that high. Well, actually, in Italy, it's been quite high because of the aging population, and also not everything's being measured. But it's the impact on the medical system that people don't really understand. So any more light you've got on that would be really enlightening for people. It was, different. it was very difficult, and it is very difficult to understand uh, what is the reality to, and to reply this question. We went through those days when on WhatsApp there was a number of recordings going around from people working within the hospitals and telling people, alarming people, and telling them, look, we, the, the beds are over, the ventilation systems are over, from tomorrow, we need to choose uh, who we want to save. 
The next days, uh, the messages that arrived were calming. And uh, in the last couple of days, the, the, the official messages, which I believe uh, were, don't worry, now the resources are available. So it's not anymore a choice of who we're going to save and we, 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 we will have to let go. So it's a mix. I think uh, for the first few days, the system was a little unprepared. So it was probably true that at some point, some doctor somewhere in Lombardia had to make a decision, to take a decision. In general, I'm sure things now, after a few days, have improved a lot. And so what is, what is it like for you and your parents, the kind of, the, the, you know, having to go through the panic and the kind of disbelief and then the, the despair? Talk us through that kind of personal journey. Because, again, for your parents or even you thinking about your parents, it's very unsettling. And, you know, your friends must be going through the same thing. Talk a bit, a bit about that. It's very personal. Um, we are managing to, to, to become, we're safe, we're pretty strong. Uh, so far, I didn't have any uh, zero degree of separation uh, cases close to me. That may be also the reason why we managed to stay calm. We could, took it seriously from the beginning. We were lucky or smart enough to do that. Uh, but of course, you're worried. Uh, no, I think in general, the population is giving a proof of a lot of stability, is very united. Uh, we're experiencing for the first time uh, an upside down Italy. Well, as you said, Lombardia is uh, by far the most productive region and industrialized region in Italy and maybe in Europe. And uh, it was interesting to see the southern people uh, staring at the north and interviewed on TV and saying, we would like to help, but we don't know what to do. Nobody knows what to do. You, you can just stay home and learn from the learning curve uh, and use the learning curve to learn from the other people's experience. Yeah, I mean, I, I really sincerely hope, looking what's going on in Spain and France and Germany, I mean, Spain was slow again. Uh, and, you know, they've just hit 4, 000, over 4,000 cases this morning at midday. They'll probably get to maybe 5,000 by the end of the day. I mean, it's exploding in Spain. They've allowed too much travel. It's does, I mean, your plea at the beginning of our conversation for people to hurry up and understand what's going on doesn't yet seem to be being taken on board. They're slowly making steps, but just haven't gone big and gone early, which seems to be the only answer here, like South Korea did. Yeah, that's exactly correct. That's exactly the feeling we have. And we feel, uh, uh, <laughs> as the south towards the north, we feel uh, we should do more to, to tell people. I've shared a lot of messages on this topic with my friends around <clears throat> Europe and the US. And uh, we should all do the same. Just be calm, but take it seriously. It will help so slowing it down. And, you know, the, the two economies that stand out to me that are potentially being irresponsible is the UK and the US that have been extremely yeah. slow in doing things. Yes, the UK has made noises, but they've also said, well, we just kind of want to see if it can burn itself out. But I think the human behavior aspect means that it can't. And the US seems to have made a huge policy error. What's your thoughts from, you know, from being in Italy and looking at the US and how they're dealing with it? It's similar to, 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 to my thought on how France, Spain, Germany were dealing with it. Uh, too slowly. Hopefully that, that will not prove to be a mistake. In the U.S. specifically, you, you mentioned demography before. Uh, the U.S. are a much younger country, so that probably will help uh, the, to have a lower mortality rate which is important, but, but that's not enough a reason to be more relaxed. No, because it's not about the mortality rate. You know, it's been, they've had the virus for 48 days now in the U.S. without really taking major actions, and that's the longest lag I've seen of any of the countries. And we saw the exponential curve that Italy went through, and you just got to think, you know, the U.S. and Italy are overlapping in their exponential curves, and it looks like you know, the U.S. has got a hell of a problem ahead of it. Yeah, it's certainly so. Uh, the, talking about our government, it was highly criticized in the first few days of the emergency. And uh, I'm sure they made some mistakes, uh, but uh, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes in that moment to treat such an emergency. 
it's like when the people, we're all trainers of the national football team. I think it's a little stupid to criticize without understanding how tough job that is. Plus, honestly, I believe uh, I'm not a particularly a fan or an opponent of our prime minister, Giuseppe Conte, but I think the body language and communication style was pretty good, surprisingly good. He speaks uh, very clearly, uh, very simply, uh, not too formally, with a language that gets very easily to all the groups of population in terms of social, age, education. And um, even a few days ago, our finance minister, Gualtieri, said uh, no one is going to lose a job because of the coronavirus. That's an incredibly strong statement. I'm not sure I would have made this statement. And I'm not even sure I believe that statement. But uh, who knows, that might be the right statement to do, to, to make uh, uh, when your priority is to keep the population calm, safe, and, and healthy, even if it's a small lie. So it's very difficult to criticize. It's very, we shouldn't do it. It's just that they're doing a good job over here.